two members of Meh Tribution Retribution have been leaked going by the first promo they promo that they cut on last night's Raw, and someone's done some detective work by altering the pitches of their distorted voice. I'm Mr. Davis, and I'm joined by the smartest man in wrestling because he bought in. He didn't sell out. It's Corporate Chopper, Mr. Hello. Chopper. Quinnell. So, on last night's episode of Raw, we'll be reviewing the whole show. Uh, of course, get your super chats in too. We'll read out every single one of them. On last night's episode of Raw, we got our first promo from Retribution. Metribution. So it's at the end of the second of two completely needless and irrelevant handicap matches in the women's tag team title picture. Nia Jax is just about to get pinned by Liv Morgan, I think, but it doesn't really matter when all the lights start to cut out. Retribution are so badass, they've given their logo in a really high-res PNG form to the production truck so it can replace the Thunderdome fans on the screens. Yeah, so it's it's cool, man. It's chaotic. That's what that is. Sure, yeah. I mean, maybe you could make the argument that they're hacking into the the WWE mainframe, but they've still made a logo. It's I don't know. It doesn't really sound very chaotic to me, but hey ho, it's what it is. They've somehow got in the production truck. I'm sure it all will make sense eventually, and that there's no logic holes here. No, and then. It cuts to like an area backstage, presumably near the production truck or some electrical cables, which has allowed them to do this. And there's a bunch of masked figures. It's very darkly lit. You can just sort of make out the outlines of people of various heights. And uh, they cut, they do a promo um, in, let's review the promo and then we can talk about who's potentially been revealed as the voices behind it. They do a promo... In that just, I hate, I did not like this episode of Raw, by the way. <laughs> I'm going yeah, to no put that out there. I thought this yeah. was a terrible episode of Raw. Love the Mysterio stuff. Love mm -hmm. the Drew and Randy stuff. But it's a three-hour show. Yeah. There's a lot of crap here. And this this really was, like, one of the biggest pieces. This retribution faction, that hasn't been good. This hasn't been a good storyline. It's not a threatening, invading force. But, you know, when you start to do the first promo, oh, there's a chance to kind of get some interest. It's a new start almost. You can finally give some character, finally give some motivation behind the dark, shady figures. And their first outing, their first impression was to cut a generic, mysterious, crappy WWE dialogue promo. Uh, a female distorted voice says this Thunderdome is a facade. Behind this mountain of screens is the same foundation, the same WWE as before, who discarded and disowned us, leaving us to survive in an unfair world. Mm, yeah. As someone that really knows how to cut good promos, uh, I'd say that this was... Okay, I'm going to say the things that I liked about it first. I liked how Dijak sounded. Well, wow, spoilers, man. Spoilers, which, we which we're going to talk the about. Voices. <laughs> the male person who spoke, probably Dijak, let's be real, uh, when he spoke, I thought that the voice alteration on him sounded cool. The stuff I didn't like was <laughs> everything else. Uh, yeah, no, the presentation wasn't great. The words were very generic. People don't really talk like that. You, I think the the concept of the promo, I think, is fine. If you want them to be an exiled group of people that want to seek vengeance against WWE for whatever reason, that's a fine concept for a promo. But you need them to actually say stuff that matters rather than just saying the generic WWE big words for things. We were discarded and stuff like that. No one says that. Just say that you were, you know shunned we want payback we want vengeance those are things that people actually say rather than whatever it was that you I genuinely can't even remember the words that you just said to me because they they're they're meaningless they're over the top hyperbolic statements they're they're not how people talk so you don't relate to it in any way 
Yeah, exactly. I'm reading a lot of comic books at the moment. And if this this is overly stylized, there's nothing wrong with it being an over the top super villain kind of speech. There's no like we're not saying, oh, it's not realistic enough because it's pro wrestling. It's it's f very far from realism, this angle. But you can have really engaging, wacky comic book style super villains. And this was nowhere close to that it was just everyone spoke the same so there were two voices there was that female voice there and the larger figure who you know pete really liked the voice of uh threatened that their darkness will seep into the pores of superstars <laughs> and the so-called universe and i was just like as soon as you said i mean i was gone already i was not liking this promo already and then you say superstars and WWE Universe. I know they said so-called universe. I guess that's a little bit better than just straight up. You might as well have said, and buy the network, $9.99. <laughs> You'll never see it coming. Just bust out a few meaningless catchphrases. or Gold tagline. rush. Yeah. <laughs> is that is that what Night of Champions is? Yeah, Clash of Champions Gold Rush is the official title for it. Yeah, it's terrible. So, so that that's their kind of mission statement. So the the two uh, voices, someone on Reddit took that audio, pitched it down, and figured out that it seems to be the voices of Mercedes Martinez, a uh, very talented wrestler who's been around for ages on the indie scene. She was in AEW for a hot second, and then she was signed by WWE last year, has done some stuff in NXT. And the guy's one was Dominic Dijakovic, uh, which... I said that name right. I think it's Dijakovic. Dijakovic. I, I don't think that sounds right to me anyway, but whatever. Um, that seems to line up with what people have been saying before as to who could potentially be in it with people, you know, when uh, they appeared on Raw and people were like, oh, these seem like different people than who originally were in Retribution. Who's that really tall man? And people seem to point out who the potential members could be. Dijakovic's been heavily rumoured. He's blacked out his Twitter for months and been posting mm -hmm. cryptic messages and things like that. Definitely seems like a front runner. So yeah, this definitely seems like this was almost certainly him that cut this promo, which... <sighs> Dijak's really good. <laughs> He's really, really good. Uh, and I'm excited for him to be on the main roster because I think he is someone who could genuinely captivate the casual audience with his presence his height his promo style when he's not in retribution could be really really good i just don't want him to be part of retribution when he's on the main roster because it's really kind of dampening him a little bit and he might need a bit of like maybe once this whole retribution thing is done he he might need like a rebrand and a refresh which is already he's only just started in a new group and we're already talking about rebranding him it's yeah i think that kind of says it all that it's a bit of a failed project right now yeah. So the and as as for the other identities, the reports are have been for ages. The people who have been carrying out the acts aren't necessarily the people who are in the faction. So people have identified Mia Yim at points by her hair. Uh that doesn't mean she'll be in the eventual revealed lineup. We don't know who the others are, but if they're getting people to cut promos, you've got to think Martinez, Dijakovic are definitely in there. As for their motivation, I mm. just so, so the motive that going by their words, it seems like the whole point. Well, initially, WWE.com got this information from somewhere. Number one, that they're called retribution. Number two, that their only cause seems to be to create chaos. This was so this was their first time of saying, here's what we're here for. This is the reason we're doing this stuff. Which should have happened ages ago because it's been just six weeks of nonsense. And they it seems like they're saying WWE cast them aside. So now they're getting their revenge on WWE, presumably for some failed promises. That to me says, well, it's the bunch of people who got released in mid-April. If it is Dijakovic and Martinez and other NXT call-ups, how does that motivation work? I, d I don't know. I... The thing is, I feel like what they're trying to do is in classic WWE fashion, they've not thought about the end goal. And what they've done is, oh, we're going to get people talking and we're going to make them think that it's the people that got released in April, but it won't be. It's going to be these other guys. But then they haven't thought about why the other people would actually have that motivation. I think they've just thought we're going to get people talking as if these people are coming back. 
gets them clicks and talks about the product or whatever, but without actual follow through with the new group. That would be my hypothesis anyway. I'll go on better. Oh, I no. don't think they even thought of that. <laughs> okay. I think, I think they've got a document uh, in like, I don't know, Google Docs somewhere, or given that it's WWE, Microsoft Vista. Mm. And they just have a few copy and paste promos for heels. And they went through and they thought that one, we haven't used it for a while. Copy and paste it out, put it in the raw script. And there you go. There was no thought about what the future motivation is. There was no thought about how it might tie in and insinuate that it could be a released bunch of people from earlier, which it definitely isn't. There's no way they'll touch any storyline like that with a without with a barge pole. Uh, although you know Drake Maverick's storyline was used down in NXT, um, and I don't think it relates to anything that's happened previously. Yeah, I just think. Much like their whole run so far, it's probably going to be a bit disappointing. Yes. So let's see what you guys thought of uh, in your su 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 super chats. Please keep on getting them in. We will read out every single one before the end of the show. Mike D says, Metribution now has a logo and a mission statement because nothing screams chaos and anarchy more than computer logos and mission statements. Mm. Yeah, I don't mind the mission statement so much mm. just because it gives us something to care about rather than what are these people doing? Computer logos, though, I agree. Yeah, I, mission statements are a huge part of sort of any terrorist organization. So I, I, I've not got a problem with them doing that. It's just I don't think they've, they've actually got a mission statement. <laughs> Uh, Kevin says, this is just on Raw in general, so who's next for the Mysterio family to beat down for an hour? My pick is CM Punk after he made a liar Mysterio cry on her ninth birthday ten years ago. Long-term booking. <laughs> WWE confirmed. Oh, man. That ending segment. I mean, we, we're going to come on to it later. I genuinely laughed at the end of the show. <laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, they're still beating him up. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. 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 I, I want a WWE.com exclusive clip where it's like for 10 hours. You know, the old <laughs> 10 hours meme. The Mysterio family beats up Buddy Murphy for 10 hours. Mm. Gavin Wilson is Dominic Mysterio's push. WWE looking at Jungle Boy, Sammy Guevara, etc. in AEW and seeing the benefits of pushing stars for the future rather than send Evolve or, or NXT. No. Because I don't think they care enough about AEW's product. They care about AEW themselves, the company. I don't think they care about what they're doing on their shows necessarily. Um, I think it's because he's Rey Mysterio's son that they're pushing him. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Gorilla Pro also, Rey's injured. Yeah. I don't, if, if Rey was available to wrestle, Dominic isn't main eventing Raws. I can yeah. guarantee you that. Uh, right Gorilla place, Press. right time for Dom, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> Gorilla Press, B is, talks exactly like that. It, that. Gorilla Press has got a few. I spoke to Dijak last night. I said, you look so cool tonight. His response to me was, where? Low, low, low. And Gorilla Press again, forgive me, Dijak's response was, when? So Gorilla Press, over the last few days, has been super mm. chatting in, trying to challenge me or something. He, he also know. sent me an email with a video to a promo that he'd done. Mm -hmm. And it was very well produced. I'm thoroughly confused. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm not sure I get it either. But uh, but but thanks for the super chats, Gorilla Press. Let's get on with the full play-by-play -play review of Raw, which opened, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, <gasps> with a good performance from Michael Cole. What? Unheard of. Gold Rush. Cole Rush. <laughs> More like... <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I thought he was really good on this episode. And I tell you what, he's actually had a pretty good streak because on SmackDown, there was a really good moment he had during the Bailey turn on Banks when Bailey was just beating up Sasha. She went to go get a chair and Michael Cole just turned to her and just completely like candid. So we're like, why? Mm. why? Why are you doing this? It was like, and it wasn't like him going, why is Bailey doing this? I can't believe it. Night of Champions, Gold Rush. It was literally just like a genuine him just being like, why? What do you, why? I was like, that actually really like elevated the segment really higher. He's been doing some good work lately. 
Cole, Michael Cole is pretty good. He's not great mm. even when he's at his best, but he's pretty yeah. good. But he is made terrible by how WWE produce him, particularly Vince McMahon produces him through the ear set. Yeah. And the headset. Ear set? Is that a thing? Headset. Mm. And I, I just, yeah, listening to him here, I, I, I kept, like halfway through the show, I was like, am I just enjoying it because it's different to Tom Phillips, mm. even though they're pretty similar? But then, like, you know, he was doing a bang up job, I thought. So, you know, credit where credit's due. I really enjoyed Michael Cole tonight. Uh, Randy Orton had the first segment, uh, standard, really good promo from Randy. He's just on fire at the moment. An yep. ambulance backs into the arena, into the Thunderdome. Drew McIntyre bursts out, hits him with a claymore. Mm. Uh, so Drew looked pretty cool uh, in, in his vest. Uh, he looked like a, a pretty cool guy. I liked Orton's promo. It's a really cool line that I really liked. It's been like, I could list all the people that I punted in the head, but I don't have enough time because Raw only runs for three hours. I was like, that's a good line. I like that. Um, and yeah, I thought Drew looked really cool. Thought this was a fine, a fine segment. I hated it by the end of the show because they could not stop showing replays of the bloody segment through the whole <laughs> bloody show. It's like, we've just, I know you've shown me five minutes ago. And it, they played it in full every time. Like, <laughs> come on, guys. They must have done three replays of the ambulance backing in. I bet they're all backstage like, this is this is the second coming of the beer <laughs> truck. This is genius. <laughs> but it was fine. It was fine. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, not that much worthy. Oh, man. Um, so uh, I, I, this is nitpicking. I don't know why it got to me. Mm -hmm. The sirens were what helped ambulance came, when the ambulance came in. Obviously, everyone's made a Scott Steiner joke or an old Cesaro joke. That was the start of their entrance music. Drew McIntyre gets out, and then his music played? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, it's so dumb. I don't know why that got to me so much. And when that happened, I thought, I'm not going to like this show, am I? <laughs> <laughs> it's just from then, you know, no, nope, it's yeah. a bad show. <laughs> uh, so the Hurt Business beat up a janitor backstage because rrr, they're bad guys. Adam Pierce, backstage mm. producer Adam Pierce. I think Kay Fabe is in control of WWE now. Yeah, he's been on a lot of shows, uh, even as far back as when they did that angle with Jeff Hardy when he got run over on mm. SmackDown and he was there kind of calming the locker room down and all that stuff. He's been present on pretty much every show since then, whether it's just been vince's guy to say go get signings on the contracts from fiend and braun and roman or just telling people what to do backstage it's yeah i guess he's an authority figure but we don't have authority figures he's pretty ineffective i, I oh, yeah. love adam pierce oh, yeah. i loved his stuff up uh, it always sticks in my mind he had this brilliant best of seven series or seven match series with colt cabana for the nwa title mm. years and years ago um it's fantastic but yeah he's bit ineffectual here again he's like drew you go home you shouldn't be cleared and drew's like sure thing mate and for the rest of the show just wanders around on his phone and adam pierce is like dude please go home and drew's like sure thing mate just like walks <laughs> off with his phone again and then he turns over to the security guys and says right so drew just got him with an ambulance I do, you know, you need to be on the top of your game because retribution are trying to invade the show. And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course we are. Yeah, got it. No worries. He's surrounded by idiots. <laughs> he did that on SmackDown as well. I can't remember whether it was this one or the one before when he, he had his little security force and he was like, guys, you know, we've got the threat of retribution coming soon. Don't want any uh, slip ups today. We've got to be on top of things. They were like, yeah, sure. Never saw him again in the episode. Mm. <laughs> Don't know what they're doing half the time. So the next match was long, long, long in the making. This has been a storyline stretching back for months, probably two, three months now. And that is Cedric Alexander potentially turning heel. At one point, it was Apollo Crews turning heel. That's how far back this was. Pre-June, pre-COVID outbreak at the Performance Center. And MVP has been, you know, like doing a really good job of sort of manipulating Cedric, playing on his insecurities, trying to get him to join the Hurt Business. And last week they kind of did it, but then they beat Cedric up afterwards. And here at the start of the six-man tag, so Hurt Business versus Apollo, Cedric, and Ricochet, they jump 
Alexander at the start of the match. So I'm like, okay, so yeah, whatever. Normal six-man tag. This should be fun. But then Cedric turned heel on Apollo and Ricochet mid-match and then started smiling with the Hurt Business and later on joined them officially. I just, it doesn't make sense. I, I, I thought this, you know, it happened. But I, I thought this was a terribly booked heel turn. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to join the people that just beat you up? And if you planned on joining them, then maybe let them know beforehand so they didn't beat you up. I. It's a weird segment. Like, you could have just had that they jumped Ricochet and Apollo and they left Cedric alone. And they don't have to make a big deal of that. You can just be like, oh, they took out the two of them and now the match is starting. But it's like a, a little subtle thing that when Cedric turns later, it's like, oh, that's why they didn't attack him earlier. That makes a lot of sense. But this one, it just doesn't gel. You've just done a heel turn for the sake of a heel turn. And you've just gone, well, we'll attack him beforehand so they won't see it coming. But yeah, we didn't see it coming because it doesn't make sense. I, Yeah, I, yeah, it's just weird. I don't get it. I, I think Cedric could be good as part of the Hurt Business. I just think it's a really sloppy way to get him there. Yeah, yeah, happy. I, I was enjoying the stuff beforehand. I think I'm going to enjoy Cedric getting hopefully more of a serious push, but the actual turn was just made no sense. Re really badly done. After that, so I didn't like that. And then we got freaking the Street Profits versus <laughs> Angel Garza and Andrade. But someone do the maths for me. Someone count up how many times, not just they've had matches against each other, but how many times I've seen angles where Garza and Andrade aren't getting on. I don't care. I never cared. Their heels, they were never properly together as a functioning unit. There's been no reason to get invested in them. They'd never win anything. And I'm just getting the same storyline two weeks after SummerSlam itself, at a point which that whole thing should have wrapped up two months prior. Yeah, I exactly what you said i don't know what else to say of it because it's just gone on for so long there's there's building tension between teammates like it's been really well done for example with like bailey and sasha that was slow building tension that went over months it probably went a little bit long anyway but it was tension that was built for a long time and it built and it built and then there was an eventual implosion this already got to the level of where they should be breaking up and then stayed there for like three months that's <laughs> not building anything that's just staying the same you're telling the same story with nothing changing that's what insane people do it's <laughs> uh, i don't know it it's really bad <laughs> it's really bad also bailey and sasha banks mm-hmm Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, Angel Garza and Andrade, Seth Rollins and Buddy. I'm Alexa sure Bliss and more. Nikki Cross. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Ricochet yeah. and Cedric Alexander. Yep. Yeah. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Gotta remember to just say bliss. Bliss. What? This is this is just like the last month. Yep. Yeah. There's but also been tension between teams. also uh, been tension between Miz and Morrison because why not, right? <sighs> it's very overdone, I'm afraid. Any anyway, speaking of overdone, this match here, Gaza pretty much left immediately, so more mm -hmm. tension. It seemed like they're done. It seemed like this feud is done. Montez Ford hit awesome frog splash. I, l I love watching that move and the way he bounces off the person he's hit it on, and. Then the, the slight botch with the referee who Montez Ford decided to run round in a circle before he made the pin, meaning the referee was out of position, had to count two and then couldn't see the shoulders. So had to readjust and count three made Andrade look crap. No one wants to get pinned for a five count <laughs> is what happened. <laughs> uh, if, if I'm Andrade and being old school. Hey, do you remember uh, when Montez Ford got poisoned? <laughs> Just... <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, moving on, then the SmackDown Tag Team Champions came out. Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura, not Sheamus, as I keep writing down in my notes. <laughs> the bar forever. Yeah, <clears throat> They came down and they challenged the Street Profits for next week's Raw <laughs> as part of the quarterly cross-brand invitational. It's I loved... <laughs> 
There's no tag teams for Cesaro and Nakamura to feud with, and there's no tag teams for the Street Profits to feud with. So they've got to feud with each other, I guess. They're breaking I, them all up. Yeah, I, I. What are they? Merge the titles at Clash of Champions, please. Merge the titles. The Iconics. The Iconics. They there's another too. one. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, Asker and Kairi saying that's not their fault, admittedly, but still, <laughs> the quarterly. Cross brand invitational was particularly, particularly <laughs> guiling. I cannot believe that rule that they had for a, a week just to get ratings draw Baron Corbin onto Raw. Mm -hmm. oh, the cheek, the cheek. Oh, and Charlotte across every show. Um, mm -hmm. So that's going to happen next week, not at Night of Champions when you would presume that gimmick makes sense. I'm assuming what they're going to do is they're going to have this match next week. One of them's going to win, or it will be a non-finish. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll have a rematch on SmackDown, which the other team will win, or it will be another non-finish, or maybe some singles matches in there between some combination of the four. And then at Clash mm -hmm. of Champions, it'll be SmackDown versus Raw for a merger of the titles. Please merge the titles. You don't have enough tag teams for two divisions. Please. They're never, they're never. That's an interesting discussion point to have. I just, I don't think they'll, I can't see them doing that. No. Um, but it happened in the, you know, that was the way the last brand split started to fizzle out. They were the first titles to blend. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, we got our truth. Well, Akira Tazawa and his ninjas tried to get our truth in a restaurant. It was not funny. I, I had literally have written our truth and ninjas. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then we got, speaking of, Peyton Royce taking on Billy Kay, unannounced for a minute, for a minute. And this, what I really like Peyton Royce. I really like Billy Kay. And they wrestled moves. You know, it was more like, a, I guess, like a series of dance things. There was no emotion there. There was, you know, it didn't really look like a fight or feel like a fight. It felt like both of them didn't want to have the match. And there was just like, I can't believe this, zero heat from an yeah. artificial crowd. I I don't understand what happened here. I don't know whether that was management tell, telling them to wrestle this style of match or them not wanting to do the style they got told to do, but they had zero emotion in this. They were really quick to get in each other's faces and start trash talking and stuff like that. It's like, you should not want to do this. You should put over that you're reluctant to be in this match. Your tag partners that have been forced to split. You shouldn't be like arguing and be quite happy to hit moves and kick each other. That should be the story, right? But they just had a match like they were any two random people. And then they hugged afterwards to make you remember, oh yeah, they were a tag team. I, I thought Weird. this was rubbish. Really, yeah. really, really bad stuff. Like Because there's, there's stuff you could have done. Peyton could have turned on Billy at the end of it. Look, unfortunately, I love Billy. I think she's very, very funny. One of the most naturally funny performers they have. But she isn't getting pushed. They, they have no plans for her. Peyton should have just turned on her. Give her a bit yeah. of momentum, a bit of heat to go forward. Uh, Peyton didn't do that. But, or, I guess the other thing you can do is have Billy say, look, we can't team together, but I want to be your coach. I yeah. think Billy Kay being Peyton Royce's coach, you get all of the best bits of the Iconics without the worst bits of the Iconics, which is Billy Kay wrestling. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> yeah. Then we got the Mysterios backstage. They had an a interview with Charlie Caruso where Buddy interrupted them. Sorry, it wasn't backstage. It was in the ring. Uh, Buddy cut a promo challenging Dom to a street fight. Yeah, I thought this was a nice promo from Murphy, just saying that he blamed Dominic for Seth blaming him, which is like a nice subversion. He doesn't realize that he's being kind of manipulated by the the person that's in charge of him, so to speak, um, which I thought was quite cool that he's still a bit oblivious. Um, and yeah, he just kind of blamed Dominic for it, which made sense. And then he said, no, I want a street fight. And yeah, they had that later on. I thought it was good. Good way to protect Dominic still as well mm. in a sort of smoke and mirrors gimmick match. Drew's yeah. still walking around backstage. Asuka and Mickey James, who will be fighting over the Raw Women's title, team together. How will they coexist against Lana and Natalia? It was 
a pretty nothing match and Asuka blind tagged herself in by spanking Mickey and won with the Asuka lock. My notes for this match are Asuka and Mickey James versus Natalia and Lana. Asuka wins. That's my that's my notes. I don't have anything else here because they didn't treat this like it was anything. It was no. And on the, the pictures, like in the morning when we get images to put in the news video, there wasn't one picture of Asuka in the whole thing. It was just Mickey, Natalia, and Lana. I'm like, she's your women's champion. Yeah. Good they've, going, guys. they've lost interest in the women's storyline. But I, I yeah. just assume Bruce Pritchard was sort of across the women's stuff on Raw when it was good the last couple of months because they're effectively his toys. Sasha Banks and Bailey were his SmackDown toys who he was lending to Raw wh where he could play with them across both brands. As soon as Sasha Banks and Bailey are now out of that picture with all that gold, it's gone from like the best story in WWE. Well, I guess it's, it's still one of the best with Banks and Bailey on SmackDown, but you know, it's at the expense of the raw booking. I don't know who's in charge of it. It just feels like it's gone nowhere since yeah. all that good work they did. Uh, after that, we got Cedric and the Hurt Business coming out for a VIP lounge segment. Kind of like this, I guess, should have been a segment for next week where you build Cedric explaining himself. Is he really with the Hurt Business? Because it's not like they all celebrated after the match earlier when he turned heel. He just walked off smiling. But no, he officially joined here, got on a T-shirt and said he doesn't want to keep sacrificing himself for Apollo's title opportunities or teaming with Ricochet, who calls himself the one and only. And he wants, you know, he wants the success and money that comes with being part of the Hurt Business. I thought it was actually a good reason. Yeah, it, it made sense, which is more than some turns that we've seen before, which is good. Um I think that he could carry himself well as a heel. I think he could really, it works being part of the Hurt Business. Um, yeah, just the turn didn't make any sense. And beforehand, they put over, just did a little backstage bit before they came out to the ring. Shelton Benjamin kind of took him aside and just said, by the way, if you're screwing with us, if this is some sort of game, mm. I'm going to find out and I'm going to hurt you. Um, I'm worried that it is some sort of game because that would make it really bad um, if that's the case. Because there wouldn't really be a point, because we've seen these before, where it goes, that was my plan the whole time, and all of them are bad. Uh, <laughs> like when Paul Heyman split from Brock Lesnar to spray Roman with some mace, and that was his big plan, and it was rubbish. So I really hope they don't do that again. Yeah, yeah, like Cedric goes, well, actually, I'm the janitor. I'm the ah. janitor. In a reverse reveal. Anyway, the baby faces came out in fury. Uh, Ricochet and Apollo with the Viking Raiders. You know, their jobber buddies, unfortunately. Mm. And they had a brawl, eight-man tag. I actually thought I actually really enjoyed this match uh, because yeah. it was eight guys just doing back and forth fun moves. Uh, I particularly liked the interaction between Ricochet and Alexander. I think the... The Cedric heel turn and how down I was on the the way it was done, which is completely ineffectual, was I, I forgot about the possibilities. And an Alexander versus Ricochet feud, the matches those two can have, very exciting prospect. I, I don't think we're going to get them, but the possibilities. I don't understand how Ricochet versus Alexander had more emotion than Peyton Royce versus Billy Kay how that doesn't make any sense but sure it did it was really good i thought cedric looked a bit more brutal than normal um some of the moves he was sitting looked really good so yeah i'm i'm cautiously optimistic about cedric as part of the hurt business mm. um so unfortunately at the end of this one of our thumbnail pictures ivar went for a dive outside he hit that dive into like six people predominantly into Bobby Lashley's forearm. I watched it back. Uh, and immediately, like as soon as he hit the dive, before, the, as soon as he hits the ground, really, he does this. You know, like he's bashing both these forearms together to create the X. He immediately knew something had gone wrong there. So he picked up an injury. I thought it was his shoulder. Uh, the rest of the observer said it, it's, it looks more like a bit of whiplash on his neck. So potentially he had a bit of a stinger where, mm -hmm. you, you know, sort of like 
momentarily paralyze yourself based uh, off a neck bump. Really scary stuff, particularly with the Matt Hardy stuff at the weekend. So they, you know, very sensibly called for the finish. Um, and Cedric just won with a Mikinochu driver. Michinoku driver. It's not Michinoku hard. driver. <laughs> it is hard when you're saying it in the morning, <laughs> and which isn't his finisher. And the referee counted three, but Ricochet definitely kicked out at two. The announcers said he kicked out at two, but I'll let them have this one because yeah. you just got to, you know, prioritize safety and kind of wraps wrap this stuff up. Totally. It would have been better if someone had managed to tell Ricochet that they were going to the finish, but you know, we'll, we'll give them it because yeah, circumstances dictate, you know, just wrap the match up. So Drew's still work, walking around on his phone backstage. Shane McMahon lets Kevin Owens into Raw Underground. And then the big guy lets Shane McMahon into the same door. See, now, when you say it like that, it sounds like it's either two different segments or there's a bit where he opens the door for Owens and then they chat for a bit and then he goes in and it's all fine. No, it was literally he opened the door. Owens walks in. He shuts the door. The big guy goes to the door, opens the door, <laughs> and then Shane walks in. <laughs> I it's think such it's... A, it's it's such a nitpick, but it makes no sense. There's no reason for that to be there. I think it's a magical door. I think it's it's the equivalent of running into platform nine and three quarters. <laughs> it doesn't open unless someone else is, you're not yeah. you can't go in yourself when you open it. I want I want people to start opening doors and you know, random doors backstage in WWE, like knock on Al Alistair Black's door, open it. But here's Raw Underground. You know, it's this mysterious room <laughs> that just moves throughout the building. You never know when it's going to be there. Someone runs in. They close the door behind them. Their attacker, their pursuer, maybe even retribution. They open the door, but it's an empty room. Where's <laughs> Raw Underground come? This is just the room of requirement from Harry Potter. That's exactly what that is. Yeah. Uh, so this was... Oh, actually, we didn't get that. Kevin Owens, Alistair Black was in a bit. Uh, before that, we had Randy Orton versus Keith Lee. I love Keith Lee. I love Randy Orton at the moment. I love how strong they're making Keith Lee look by booking him with Randy Orton in this main event mix. But it's been the, it's been the same thing for three weeks now, two to three yeah. weeks. And as cool as Keith looked, blocked an RKO just by being strong. He looked looked awesome. Drew ran in, hit a claymore on Randy, and that was the end of the match. Keith just thanos away, rolled out the ring. No, all right, mate. I gave you a free pass on the first one when you made me lose by DQ, but you're not going to do it again. There was none of that. I just, I thought this was this was a bad. This was this was a this was bad. But fine in isolation, I'm more worried about what it could signal for how they're booking Keith Lee moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I saw something either on Twitter or online somewhere that said that Keith Lee was annoyed at Drew, but there's no evidence of that on the show itself. Mm. So you really need to display that more if that is the story that you're going to be telling. If it's potentially leading to, you know, a triple threat at Clash of Champions or something great, you need to tell a better story to get there because right now, I think what they've done is they said, wow, people really liked what we did with Keith Lee. Let's just do more of it uh, instead of actually progressing it to the next point and building him like a proper star instead of just doing the same things over and over again. Yeah. Uh, Adam Pierce still annoyed with Drew backstage. There were so many of these segments. <laughs> uh, yes, then we got were. Raw Underground, people. It's Shane McMahon's sweaty scuffle club Kevin Owens versus Alistair Black. Feels like a big match. Mm. I kind of would have preferred it to have been in an actual ring. And they it's as soon as it gets started, they cut away to a commercial break and a backstage segment with Randy talking to Adam Pierce. And then these two then a then one of the handicap matches of the Riot Squad versus Shayna Baszler, then back to KO and Black. Then back to the Thunderdome for the other handicap match against Nia. 
then the retribution angle that we've already spoken about with the promo, and then back to Kevin Owens and Alistair Black. That's ha that, half an hour that match has been going on for, and they got about a minute of screen time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so dumb. And again, it feels like a nitpick, but it really affects like the flow of the show and how much you're invested in the segments that come between it. Because you start to get invested in Black versus Owens and it gets taken away and then you're like, oh, okay, but we'll come back to Black versus Owens in a second. And then you start to see this other stuff and you go, oh, I really want to see Black versus Owens. Okay, I'll start watching this other thing. That thing ends in about a minute, so you don't even have time to get invested in that. Then they cut to another promo and you go, oh, we're going back to the Black versus Owens thing? Yeah. And then eventually when you get back there, you're like, oh, they're on screen. Great. And then that goes 30 seconds. It's really bad. I had a rant about this on SmackDown as well, because they did exactly the same thing on SmackDown as well. Just cutting between a load of segments. There was about 20 minutes between when the first person made their entrance for the main event and when the main event actually started. It was so dumb. I, yeah, it, I really hate it. Sort it's it definitely, out. definitely bad from a structure of a TV show. Uh, but it's also bad for Raw Underground. Like this, yeah. this concept is dead now. Like there's, it means nothing. Uh, I, I hate it. I mean, I did it ever it mean away. anything? Well, no, but it had the possibility of meaning something. Mm. Now they've gone to they've gone past that point of it ever being salvageable, I think. So that was bad. Uh there was there wasn't even a winner either. Dabakato got in and beat them both up. I will say, I mean, I didn't like Raw Underground whatsoever, but um Yabba Dabba Kato, whatever he is. <laughs> I thought he looked pretty good. Like his mm -hmm. choke slam and Alistair Black was awesome. It was really cool. But like, I don't care because it's in Raw Underground and I don't care about Raw Underground. So in in all of these segments where these women's handicap matches, which uh, there was a lot of rubbish stuff on this show. This was like the most backwards booking, though. This was the most against common sense where you've got the team of Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax, technically two heels, but they're a, they've got a bit of a tweener status right now, an odd couple tag team that ended up winning the Women's Tag Team Championships. They're only contenders, not just from winning uh, the number one contenders match, but also kind of by default, because they've broken up every other tag team right now, the Riot Squad, Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot recently reunited, they get handicap matches but not to the disadvantage of the baby faces, you know, the standard psychology of every handicap match ever. No, it was the Riot Squad two-on-one -on -one against Shayna Baszler first and then against Nia Jax. Who came up with this idea? It ruins everybody. It makes the Riot Squad look like jabronis. Sure, that even if they, even when they won, and they, they won the first one and they were close to winning the second one, it it just ugh, this was terrible stuff. Yeah, I, there's there's no reason for it, and they try to justify it on commentary. They try to say, and this has come about because Shayna said that she could beat both the Riot Squad by herself. Okay, show us that instead of telling it. Now, even then, it's still not great, but at least you've actually got a reason <laughs> that we've seen of Shayna being a bit arrogant because she kind of beat Bailey and Banks by herself on the, mm. you know, at um, Payback to win the tag titles. So there's sort of a story there. Still doesn't make sense that they're facing baby faces, but at least there's some bit of a story there. But they don't even show that. They just do the match and expect the commentary to just explain everything, which is really bad. Storytelling 101, show, don't tell. It's really, really simple stuff. Oh man, it's annoyed me. Yeah, it was I think <sighs> that was just awful. Um, then backstage, after all the KO Alistair stuff as well, Randy is selling the Claymore from the match earlier, and Drew attacked him with another Claymore. Uh, and really sort of that Orton sold it a lot and got taken to the hospital. So they're kind of one apiece now. I I'm actually a big fan of this. I like how they're building the feud around finishers. The Wrestling Observer criticised this for sort of giving away the revenge payoff already because Drew's got his own back on the heel, which I understand. But I I think this feud is about more than you hit me. It's more about who is the better wrestler, which is something they established at SummerSlam and that fantastic finish, which you didn't like, I, I know. Uh, but now they're sort of building it around 
the finish account. Yeah, which I, I'm all for. I, I want them to properly get involved. Because that was the one thing I didn't really like uh, at the match was that there wasn't any finishes. It felt a bit sudden to finish it. Obviously, now the feud has gone on, but now I want them to have a proper match. I'd love to see Drew kick out of an RKO, for example. I think that would be great. be mm. a really cool moment because they built it properly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Uh, so the other shining light on what was an otherwise terrible show was a really, really good main event. Dominic getting the main of like Dominic versus Buddy in the main event of Raw. I liked it. I think it's going to tank in the ratings. <laughs> it's hardly like a big star power drawing match. But the whole fact, the whole Mysterio family are down there at ringside. Buddy's kind of fighting to prove himself to Seth. They brawl everywhere. It's a street fight. Uh, Dominic hits a great dive off the Thunderdome stands near the start. Uh, they go back and forth. Really, really good stuff. Dominic is so, so impressive. Mm. And he hits this sunset flip powerbomb dive outside, you know, out the ropes, through a table on Buddy to perfection, then ties him up in the ropes. And the entire Mysterio family just wail on him with a kendo stick for about five minutes. And they yeah. were still doing it when the show went off air. It was a long time, and this didn't feel like... At the start, it felt like this is Dominic's pent-up aggression that he's just letting out on Buddy. And then at the end, it turned into comedy when everyone else got involved and all of them just started just absolutely wailing on Buddy Murphy. I started laughing because it was really funny. What were they doing? Wailing on him? No, no, the, the, the action, the hand action you just did. That? <laughs> Great content for podcast listeners. Yeah, I, I I didn't mind it because it was funny, but it wasn't funny to the extent where I was, I guess I was laughing at it, but I was also into it because the yeah. Mysterio family have had a rough old time in this feud, in these the weirdest contract negotiations of all time. So I didn't, you know, they, they took out Ray's eye in kayfabe. I, I didn't mind this. It was silly, but it was that kind of pro wrestling silliness that I appreciate. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it was bad because it mm. wasn't. It just, I think it, it, it didn't, it started off just being like, oh yeah, this is the big storyline payoff. And then it was just like, oh, you're just killing a man. Okay, cool. <laughs> like, they just absolutely went to town on him, which was, it was fun. So I don't know what this means for Seth and Buddy. I feel like they're done as an act. I, I don't think so. At least I hope not, because it seemed like Buddy was still kind of on Seth's side. Like earlier, he was saying, like, you know, Ray was saying to Buddy, he's like, well, I'm sorry that you sided with a guy that, you know, doesn't appreciate you. That's not our fault kind of thing. And Buddy was saying, oh, yeah, no, actually, it's Dominic's fault because Seth's still great. I mm. Dominic still sucks. So I'm hoping that it still kind of just plays into it in that Seth didn't save Buddy, whereas Buddy would probably save Seth in the same situation. So it kind of just furthers a bit of tension between them. It's what I'm hoping anyway, because I don't really want them to be done just yet. But well, we'll see. I think I think it's done. Yeah, the, the maybe another tag a team split up. AOP released Austin Theory back down to NXT. Mm. Yeah, the Monday Night Messiah Act has ended with a whimper, not a bang. I is my <sighs> prediction. Overall, I thought this was a just a terrible show. Re really like boring, dragging bad booking show but it had a really good main event and a really good main event narrative with Orton and McIntyre so I, I gave it a 2 out of 5 I'd absolutely agree on that um, I thought it was quite boring for the vast majority of the show um, and something that I picked up as, picked up on as well is that the show just felt so formulaic and so factory made that like everything felt the same even when it was different like the stuff that really stood out to me was like dominic diving off the side of the thing and doing the the power bomb through the table everything else in every other match felt exactly the same it like it didn't feel like any different people were wrestling nothing in the content of the matches don't matter which is a real shame because you have so many talented people with so many unique styles and they've all just kind of been flattened to be the same wrestler is what it felt like on this show. Yeah. Yeah, I'd give it two out of five as well. 
Before we get on with your super chats, last call, we'll be getting to every single one of them before the show ends. Let's do our Patreon shout outs for our wonderful $25 a month or more pledge hammers on Patreon. Go over to Patreon, uh, our WrestleTalk Patreon, to see all the little benefits and exclusive content you can get. But thank you. He's no jackass, Dano. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Rob Steiner Recliner. Woo! Yes. Thank you. Jack Daniels on the Carl Rocks. Woo, yes, thank you. Bad connection, Thomas Lagden. Oh, thank you, Dom. Blompier's number one fan, Tom Delves. Woo, thank you very much. Andrew, the last airbender, Mercogliano. Woo. Thank you. Jamie Donovan Dijak. Woo, thank you oh, very man. much. Yo, Adrian. Rocky. Woo, thank, thank you very you, Rocky. much. Rocky. Ross Pooper Scooper Cooper. Ooh, lovely. Thank you very much for that. Uh, spoken class today, Jeremy Smith. It's a Pearl Jam reference that Luke usually sings. I'm glad he's gone. Never yeah. wrong, Tyler Wright. Woo, thank you very much. And finally, for, for today, the jester, Ryan Kester. Woo, thank you, thank you. Ryan. Right, so let's get into your, your remaining super chats. Gorilla Press, Orton and Edge had to pause their Mania 36 match whilst Buddy ran through them, still getting beaten by the Mysterio family. <laughs> That would be so good. Uh, Sats Vault. Why did Pierce apologize to Orton? He's no victim. I mean, he kind of got claymored when Drew shouldn't have been there. So that's Pierce's fault. Yeah. Yeah. Jack Meredith. Plot twist. Adam Pierce is both the hacker and the head of retribution. Ollie Thority for life. Thank you very much. That makes sense. That genuinely. That's how does they're make, doing it. That that's, uh, actually does make sense, and I hate the fact it makes sense. Blake, main event reminded me of Kung Pao. Mysterio is <laughs> waiting for Buddy to give the signal or dramatically throw him to the ground and request a towel. It's absolutely spot on. That's absolutely what it is. It's that scene from Kung Pao. Oh my God. That, yep, it is. If you haven't seen Kung Pao, go watch it. It's funny. Nick Ward. Hey, Mysterio family. Stay away from Australia for a while, you goddamn heels, angry face emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I saw uh, some people on Reddit were taking the angle out of context and rewriting it in a Fox News style headline. <laughs> and it was Latino family uh, assault Australian over religious disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Luke Nicol, Apollo Crews and Ricochet should join the Hurt Business as well. <laughs> Would make no sense i no. think cedric's heel turn made sense because if you can't beat him join him justice for luke well you're not that smart then if that's what you're saying at the end prod by d matic kevin owens and keith lee that a shoot promo on raw talking why don't you guys watch raw talk because we only have so much time to make all these videos watch raw itself do all the pictures set up these live streams and all that sorry yeah and also, that's not part of the TV show. We shouldn't have to watch supplementary content to understand the actual content. Uh, Kian Harvey, it's Clash of Champions this month. You know what that means? More cock jokes. I, for one, can't wait for the cock versus cock rematch. Is Hell it yeah. Clash or Night? It's Clash. Yeah, it, it's, it, it was Night until like a couple years ago, I think. And then they changed it to Clash. I don't know why. Um, we've got some Wrestle Talk related super chats now in general. Uh, Zachary Jenkins said, uh, "Mr. Davis, I'm sorry for my transgressions. I will put on the jacket. I will put on the jacket. Just kidding. Hashtag Luke Takeover. No Luke Takeover. Absolutely not. Gorilla Press said, "Hello Oliver. Good day, Chopper. Good day." Uh, will Ware said, "The truth will be revealed, and justice will be served tomorrow when Quizzlemania X8 and the Olive uh, the Oli Authority will not survive tomorrow." disagree wholeheartedly uh also crap raw agree on that one raw. yeah but it was uh, on your a team the x the x sort of numbering stops it's, now, it's, it? it's, it's x8 is it x8 yeah it's x8 and then i think it's 19 i sit down corrected i might be wrong can't remember um peter mullins said uh, remember everyone luke screwed luke no way he's getting his job back especially not so, uh, especially not through some sort of brand warfare no he wouldn't dare Jam that jam. Jam that jampion, Mr. Davis, right there. Joey plays. Uh, 
Ollie, it's Mr. Davis. Thank you very much. Uh, you don't do stuff for the people because the people want lukewarm Luke Owen. Yes, please. No, they don't. No, they don't. No. Jam that jam right there. It's Yep, there it is. It's beautiful. Gavin Wilson said, also, congrats on the championship win. You know what we want. Hashtag jam that jam. Jam that jam, everybody. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Nate Drops Surname said, uh, just because you look like a mini big show doesn't mean you have to have as many heel face turns as him. Going to have to burn my chopper shirt. I have no idea what you're talking about with heel and face turns, uh, but have fun burning your chopper shirt while I'm earning more money than Luke because he doesn't have a job. <laughs> Cheers. Anderson Floyd. It's great to see such best friends review Raw. Hashtag Ollie Authority for life. Yeah. Best friends reviewing Raw. It's great. We got some general such miscellaneous super chats. Jesse Venable. Uh, why Why do Iron Man 3 and The Incredibles have the exact same story? Both ignore a fan that turns to a supervillain and both have black partners help fi that help fight crime. Kind of is the same story, if I'm honest. Oh, God. It's a bit heavy. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. It really is. Sorry, I'll have to carry like it for not, you at some point. Not an optimum oh, way to align your shoulders either. No, it's fine. But yeah, they, they do have similar stories. They have very similar stories, yeah. Um, Start Recording said, Hi, guys, it's my birthday today. Turned 26, young, uh, 26 years young. Chopper, are we the same age? Also, do you think a heel character is what Black has needed? Uh, we're not the same age. I'm 27. Um, and uh, happy Hanukkah. Uh, a heel character, yes, I do think it is what, what Black needed because the main roster couldn't book him as a face properly. So, sure, give him a try as a heel. He looks good as a heel. So, I think he looks cool. Uh, Rick Parsons donated, but with no message. Thank you very much. And there's a few last-minute ones that have come in. Uh, Nate Drop's surname said, uh, The family beatdown was fun, but the rest of the show was bad. Drew stole an ambulance. <laughs> Black KO squashed an underground. Horrible. That's the repackaging of Black. So disappointing. Yeah, I mean, he still looks cool, and I think he can fight properly. Like, he looked like he was a legit fighter during the segment kind of thing. But, yeah, it's not great, is it? Could be used so much better. Uh, Devante Lee said, yes, please. No, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Gorilla Press said, uh, "We're speaking to, uh, when speaking to Sean Ross Sapp last night, I mentioned, what if Adam Pierce is somehow allowing Retribution into the building somehow? A swerve. Um, yeah, that's what we mentioned earlier uh, from another Super Chat, just saying, yeah, it could be... Uh, yeah, Adam Pierce. Gorilla Press again said hashtag press that press. Still don't Who? know what's going on. I, still, I genuinely don't know. <laughs> what? Not a clue. <laughs> Couldn't tell you. Yeah. Uh, and Gutier, 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 25 said Adam Pierce versus security team is feud of the year. I mean, yeah, they could build it up properly. Be better than a lot of the other stuff they've done. Thank you for all your super chats. That's all we've got time for for today's episode of the Raw Review podcast with the All Authority, Mr. Davis and Mr. Corporate Chopper, Pete Quinnell. Please go over and watch the other videos that have gone up on Wrestle Talk today, like my Raw Review and the Wrestle Talk News, which is talking about. What was it talking about? How Raw is falling apart backstage. It's not just on screen, folks. Those things can be felt through the entire creative process. Go over to Parts of Unknown as well, where you can watch a little bit of Luke because he made a video before we fired him with Cooling Spots Episode 4. It's a fun one. Also, go over and subscribe to Wrestle 2 because me and Mr. Chopper have made Wrestle Talk clips, formerly Wrestle Luke, a much better proper channel that you want i've been mr davis this has been mr chopper we're the jam that champions that was wrestling jam that jam join the all authority